Hello dear students who are watching this program here in Ethiopia in different parts of the world. My name is Yeshua Fisaha. I am a chemistry instructor at Labawi International Academy. Today we're going to revise the first unit of grade 11 chemistry. As you all know, grade 11 chemistry textbook has six different units. In this session, we will only focus on some of the main points of this unit. Stay tuned. Fundamental concepts in chemistry. Definition of chemistry. What is meant by chemistry? Well, chemistry is the science that deals with matter and the change that it undergoes. It is a study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter and of the change that occur in matter. The only permanent thing in the world is change. For instance, iron rusts, snow melts, paints peel off, we grow up and we grow old. All these are chains. So when we say the only permanent thing in the world is change, we're literally referring to all these natural phenomena. Understanding change is closely related to understanding the nature and the composition of matter, the physical material of the universe. I'm sure in your lower grade chemistry classes, you said a lot about matter. So here, if I ask you a very simple question which says what is meant by matter, then what would be your answer? Well, I'm sure that you will easily answer this question by saying matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. And the chains around us are of two types. Well, what are the two different chains that are found in our environment? Well, normally the two chains that are found in our environment are one, chemical chains, and two, physical chains. And again, in your lower grades, you said a lot about the distinction that lies there between chemical chains and physical chains. So let's say a few words about the first type of change, which is called chemical change. What is meant by chemical change? Well, a chemical change, which is more commonly called chemical reaction or chemical reactions, are processes whereby one substance is transformed into another as a result of combination or dissociation of atoms. So remember, a chemical change is a change which is sometimes a cold chemical reaction and this is a change that is vividly or that is clearly seen in our environment well can we mention some examples of chemical chains sure we can mention some examples of chemical chains for instance oxidation of matter meaning rusting of iron or burning of wood can easily be regarded as one of the examples of chemical chains can we still mention another example of chemical chains? Sure, fermentation. I'm sure you're familiar with the process called fermentation, a kind of process that is widely applied in biology. Of course, this process can also be applied in chemistry, but it is widely applied in biology, particularly in connection with uh, the action of yeasts. So once fermentation takes place, then the result is something new and as a result this is what is meant by a chemical change can we mention another example of a chemical change yes the change of milk into yogurt so all the aforesaid or all the aforementioned examples can simply or can clearly show or can clearly help us to you know, understand what chemical chains look like or what chemical chains are well, having said this much about chemical chains, now it is our time again to say a few words about physical chains. So what are physical chains? Well, these are chains that differ from chemical reactions in that the involved substances do not change their identities, meaning each retains its composition. So students here, there is one point that I want you to remember about the difference between a chemical change and a physical change. In chemical change, always, new substances are formed with new properties or with new characteristics but in physical chains always the substance retains its identity meaning in other words the substance does not change its identity well how can we explain this by simply using an example let's take a look at one very simple example that all of you are accustomed to that is dissolving 
table salt or the dissolution of table salt in water. You know that table salt, which is sodium chloride, is one of the substances that can easily be dissolved in a solvent called water. So when sodium chloride is placed in water, then sodium chloride dissolves. But once sodium chloride dissolves, then it won't disappear forever. Well, there is a possibility or there is, I mean, there is a mechanism that enables us or that enables you to get that dissolved salt back. So here, sodium chloride, though it dissolves in water, still it is sodium chloride, meaning it doesn't change its characteristic into something else. In this case, we can simply regard this example as a physical change. So thus far, we've clearly seen the clear distinction that lies there between physical change and chemical change. And I'm sure you've gotten the clear uh, difference there between those two chains. So all these chains, well, chains uh, in connection with physical chains or chains in connection with chemical chains surround us. So that's why we said at the outset that change is uh, a very permanent thing in our world. So let's proceed our discussion and now let's move on to the uh, other two terminologies that are again uh, go hand in hand with physical properties. Remember, thus far we've classified chains into physical chains and chemical chains. Now it is time for us to see the other classes of physical properties. Now physical properties are of two types and normally these two, uh, two types of physical properties are one, extensive physical properties and two, intensive physical properties. So what major distinction lies there between these two types of properties? Well, with regard to extensive physical properties, well, normally these are properties that depend on the amount or quantity of sample and therefore can vary from sample to sample. So any physical property that depend on the amount or quantity of sample and it can vary from sample to sample can easily be regarded as an extensive physical property. Well, still we do have another type of property, which is called intensive physical property. So intensive physical properties are those properties which do not depend on the amount of a substance present. So here, intensive physical properties are completely different from that of extensive physical properties. So as far as physical properties are concerned, well, these are the two points that must be clearly understood. Well, now let's move on to brands of chemistry. Well, as an independent natural science discipline, chemistry is further divided into different branches. Well, this is very common amongst uh, natural science uh, disciplines. For instance, if you take a look at biology, well, biology is a branch of natural science. This branch of natural science is further divided into other branches. And by the same token, when we come to chemistry, of course, chemistry uh, does also have different brands. And uh, of course, here in this discussion, we won't see or we won't touch all the different branches of chemistry. But here under this discussion, we'll only try to focus on some of the common or some of the well-known brands of chemistry. So let's begin with the first well-known type of, or let's begin with one of the well-known brands of chemistry, which is called inorganic chemistry. So what does inorganic chemistry study? Well, as you all know, inorganic chemistry is the study of all the elements and their compounds. But here we get exceptions, with the exception of carbon and its compounds. So what does inorganic chemistry study? Normally inorganic chemistry studies about you know, the different elements and their compounds, with the exception of carbon and their compounds. Well, the other well-known branch of chemistry is called organic chemistry. So organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon compounds, except carbides, cyanides, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, carbonates, and hydrogen carbonates. So here, organic chemistry exclusively studies about those compounds that contain carbon. 
But bear in mind here, organic chemistry is not concerned about compounds such as carbides, cyanides, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, carbonates, and hydrogen carbonates. And what is the reason why organic chemistry is not concerned about these different compounds? Because from the very beginning, these compounds completely show you know, different properties, those organic compounds. Of course, they might contain carbon in them, but though they contain carbon in them, well, they do not completely show, you know, the uh, characteristics of organic compounds. Instead, they show the characteristics of inorganic compounds. And because of this reason, organic chemistry is not concerned about all these compounds because as has already been said these compounds exclusively show the characteristics of other inorganic compounds well the third type of uh, or the third branch of chemistry is called physical chemistry and physical chemistry is the study of physical properties of materials such as their thermal electrical magnetic behavior and their interaction with electromagnetic fields so this uh, sort of chemistry is simply referred to as physical chemistry. And the fourth type of chemistry, which is again very popular, is analytical chemistry. So analytical chemistry is a branch of chemistry which is concerned with the development of theoretical foundations and methods of chemical analysis. It involves separating, identifying, and determining the relative amount of components in a sample material. So this sort of chemistry or branch of chemistry that is concerned with all the aforementioned things is simply referred to as analytical chemistry. The fifth and the most important type of or branch of chemistry is called biochemistry. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this branch of chemistry, which is called biochemistry. Really, biochemistry is an integrated type of you know discipline and here when i say it is an integrated type of discipline it means this branch of chemistry is the combination of two different natural science disciplines one of the natural science disciplines is called biology and the other uh, natural science discipline is called chemistry so here when these two different disciplines are merged then one discipline one new discipline uh, is formed and of course this newly formed uh, discipline is called biochemistry. So, because of this reason, biochemistry can simply act as a bridge that connects two disciplines, two natural science disciplines, namely chemistry and biology. So, what does it study? What does biochemistry study? Normally, biochemistry studies about the molecules and chemical reactions of life, and it utilizes the principles and language of chemistry to explain biology at the molecular level. So, what um, this uh, discipline does is that it uses some of the principles that are um, found in chemistry to deeply study about uh, the various things that are found in biology. So, you know, there are various things that need to be explained at the molecular level in biology. Therefore, to explain all those things that are found at the molecular level in biology, well, biochemistry is used. So these are some of the well-known branch of chemistry and as I've said at the outset, well these are not the only branch of chemistry. Of course there are other branches of chemistry but these are some of the well-known branches of chemistry. Very good. Now let's move on to the other very important part of unit one that is the seven SI base units. So Measurements uh, are widely used in chemistry, meaning in other words, there are certain things that must be measured. So to measure those things, well, chemists use different measurement tools. So in chemistry, the following measurement tools and their SI base units are widely used. For instance, if there is a physical quantity, which is called mass, and if this physical quantity, which is called mass, is measured or must be measured then a chemist has to use an SI unit of mass and of course the SI unit of mass as you all know is kilogram so the physical quantity mass is always measured in chemistry by kilogram so the SI unit of mass is kilogram what if a chemist needs to 
measure length? Well, if length is measured or if a chemist needs to measure length, then that scientist or that chemist has to use the SI unit or the SI base unit that is used to measure length. So the SI base unit that is used to measure length is meter. Time is always measured by second. Temperature is always measured by Kelvin. Amount of substance is measured by mole. Electric current is always measured by ampere. And luminous intensity is always measured by candela. So here, seven different physical quantities and their SI base units are listed, but in chemistry, the first six physical quantities and their SI base units are widely used. Okay, having said this much about uh, the seven SI base units and you know, physical quantities, now let's move on to some of the common prefixes used in SI units. So, some of the most commonly encountered prefixes in chemistry are the following. The first one is tera. So, tera literally refers to trillion and it is represented by capital T. Two, giga. Giga literally refers to billion and giga is always represented by capital G. Mega, billion, capital M. Kilo, thousand, capital K. Deci, tens of, D, small d. Centi, hundredth of, small c. Milli, thousands of, a small m. Micro, millionth of, mu. Nano, billionth of, small n. And the last one is pico, trillionth of, small p. So what are these? All these are the common prefixes that are used in the SI units, particularly in connection with measurements in chemistry. The other very important point is uncertainty in measurements. So measurements are very common in chemistry and whenever we measure things in chemistry, well, we have to use certain measurement tools. But the, the outcomes of our measurements might not be accurate. So in scientific work, we recognize two kinds of numbers. Well, the first number is called exact number or exact numbers. And the second sort of numbers are called inexact numbers. So what major distinction lies there between these two sort of numbers? Well, when we say exact numbers, we mean those values are known exactly. So the values are known exactly. But when we say inexact numbers, we mean those values have some uncertainties. So here, numbers obtained by measurement are always inexact. So what are some of the causes of uncertainties? Why are uncertainties occur most of the time? Well, uncertainties always exist in measured quantities. And the following are the most important causes of uncertainties. So some four commonly known, the following are some of the most common you know, causes of uncertainties. Well, the first common cause of uncertainty is called the person doing the measurement. And the second one is the measuring device itself. And the third is the environment where the measuring is being made. And the fourth one is variability in the item being measured. So in general, these are some of the commonly known factors that make you know, measurements to be uncertain. All right, dear students, thus far we've seen three important things, namely the definition of chemistry, the branch of chemistry, and the different SI units that are frequently used during measurements in chemistry. Now it's time for us to move on to another subtopic entitled precision and accuracy in chemistry. Well, as far as um, measurement is concerned, two terminologies are frequently used. And normally what are those two terminologies that are frequently used? Well, the first is precision and the second is accuracy. So precision and accuracy are terms that go hand in hand and they are always, um, or they, they always have something, uh, they always have a direct connection with measurement. Well, precision and accuracy are terms which are used to express uncertainties in measurement. So now let's have a look at the meanings of these two terms. The first is precision, and the second is accuracy. So let's begin with precision. So what is meant by precision? Precision refers how clearly individual measurements agree with another. 
So this is called precision. And the second is accuracy. So accuracy literally refers to how closely individual measurements agree with the correct or true value. So these are the uh, meanings of both precision and accuracy. But there is one point that must clearly be understood here. Not measurements of high precision are more likely to be accurate than are those poor precision. But even highly precise measurements are sometimes inaccurate. Precision and accuracy are linked with two common types of errors called random error and systematic errors. So here again, we do have uh, two uh, sort of errors. The errors that are made uh, are of two types or the errors that are made can be classified into two. So the first is random error. So random error makes a measurement less precise, but not in any direction. In other words, the actual value may be either greater or smaller than the value one records. And the second type of error is called systematic error. So systematic errors produce values that are either entirely higher or smaller than the actual value. So these errors arise from flaws or defects in the instrument or from errors in the manner that the instrument was taken. Well, our next discussion will be about uh, chemistry as experimental science. So here, it's obvious that chemistry is um, an experimental science, meaning this uh, discipline is always supported with experiments. So experimental sciences in general are governed by one thing, which is called the scientific method. So the scientific method literally refers to a general approach to problems. So any chemist, any physicist or any biologist always uses the scientific method whenever he or she wants to approach any specific problem. So the scientific method is very, very essential. But here, there is one question. What is the importance of the scientific method? Well, the scientific method, as has already been said, is a method that helps a scientist or that helps a chemist to approach any problem and solve it. And this scientific method involves making observations, collecting data, seeking patterns in the observations, formulating hypotheses to explain the observations, and testing these hypotheses by further experiments. So here, since chemistry is on experimental science, of course, it really requires the scientific method. And once the scientific method is applied, or once the scientific method is used, then the scientific method involves or must involve all the aforesaid or all the aforementioned things. One, first, the scientist has to observe what is going on around him or around her. Then he or she has to collect data. Then he or she has to seek patterns in the observations. Then he or she formulates hypotheses or hypotheses to explain the observations and test and finally, he or she tests these hypotheses by further experiments. So in general, the scientific method is uh, a basic tool of you know, chemists, or it is uh, a fundamental or one of the fundamental things that must be included in all um, experimental sciences, uh, namely biology, chemistry, and physics. Very good. Now let's move on to the other very important thing, which is called chemistry laboratory safety rules. So remember a short while ago, we frequently said that chemistry is an experimental science. So since chemistry is an experimental science, meaning in other words, there are a lot of experiments that must be conducted. So here is a point. Where do these experiments must be done? So to do these experiments, of course, there must be a place. And of course, that place where experiments are conducted is called a chemistry laboratory. So students must frequently go to a chemistry laboratory to conduct different experiments. But before they move on or before they go to a chemistry laboratory, well, first, they must have a very good understanding of what is going on there in a chemistry laboratory. So chemistry laboratory safety rules come here because here, you know, a student has to know what he or she must do and must not do in a chemistry laboratory. So the chemistry laboratory may be considered as a place of discovery and learning, but whenever students are allowed to go and 
sit in a chemistry laboratory or do different activities in a chemistry laboratory. Well, they must do all those things with much care. So by the very nature of lab work, it can be a place of danger if proper common sense precautions are not taken. Different experiments can easily be conducted in a chemistry laboratory, this is true, but proper uh, precautions must first be taken. Uh, otherwise, that um, place, which is called a laboratory, might be a place of danger. So what must be done in a chemistry laboratory? So the following must be done in a chemistry laboratory to make the environment uh, safe and to protect students from different hazards. So students are required or students are expected to do the following things whenever they are in a laboratory. So the first thing is students must protect their eyes with proper eye goggles. Second, they must wear appropriate protective clothing. Third, they must wear shoes that cover their feet. Four, they must tie back loose hair, particularly this one works for those, for those girls. Five, eating and drinking in the lab is strictly, strictly, strictly forbidden. Nothing must be eaten in a laboratory, particularly in a chemistry laboratory. Of course, in all laboratories, um, foods and drinks must not be consumed. And the other thing that must be done in a chemistry laboratory is smelling chemicals, meaning students are not allowed to smell any sort of chemical. So after all these things are properly done, then finally that place, which is called a laboratory, can become a place of you know, experiment so that different hazards would easily happen. So if there are no hazards, then students can freely do or can freely perform various experiments. So now in a chemistry laboratory to perform various activities or to perform various um, experiments, well, chemistry laboratory apparatuses are needed. So chemistry uh, lab equipments comprise different sets of apparatus which are designed to perform various tasks in the lab. So on the basis of their uses, apparatuses in chemistry can be categorized into three major categories. So the first category is called reaction vessels. There are certain materials that are collectively called reaction vessels. So what are those materials that are collectively called reaction vessels? Well, beakers, flasks, boiling tubes, and test tubes. All these are collectively called reaction vessels. The second group of laboratory equipments are called measuring equipments. So we do have examples for measuring equipments. Pipettes, burettes, balances, and thermometers are collectively called measuring equipments. And the third categories of materials are collectively called support and heating devices. So we do also have um, examples for this, such as stand and lamp, tripod and goes, spirit burner and Bunsen burner. So all these are collectively called support and heating devices. So in general, these are the three main classes chemistry laboratory equipments. Remember, reaction vessels, which includes beakers, flasks, boiling tubes, and test tubes. Two, measuring equipments such as pipettes, burettes, balances, and thermometers. And three, support and heating devices such as stand and lamp, tripod and gauze, spirit burner, and Bunsen burner. Then after different experiments are done or are made in a chemistry laboratory, then a student has to produce his own report. So to produce his own report, well, the student has to prepare a laboratory report. So a laboratory report from the very beginning is a written composition of the results of an experiment. So any experiment right after it is conducted, then it must be properly written and given to the person concerned. For example, a student has to include the following important components in his or in her laboratory report, and finally he or she must submit his or her work to the teacher. So this is what is meant by a laboratory report. So whenever a laboratory report is written, then that laboratory report has to include the following seven important components. So what are the seven very important components of a wonderful or good laboratory report? Well, one, that laboratory report must have its own title. Two, that laboratory report must have its own objective. 
three, that laboratory report must have or must contain the materials that the student has used. Four, the procedures must be properly jotted down. Five, the data and the observations must also be properly listed and explained. Six, the results must be discussed in a very terse or in a very simple manner. And finally, the conclusion must also be written properly. Well, thus far, we've seen these, you know, important points from the first unit, meaning unit one. So now this is uh, time for me to pose some questions to know whether you uh, have understood the things that I've presented uh, so far. So let me uh, pose some four questions and let you answer these four questions from the information that I've been giving you so far. So my first question is, list some three branches of chemistry. So how can you answer this question? Well, easy. You can answer this question by saying this. Well, chemistry has many branches and the following are some of its branches. So you can say organic chemistry. You can say inorganic chemistry. Still, you can also say analytical chemistry. Still, you can say biochemistry. So all in all, these are the uh, four or these are some of the well-known branches of chemistry. Well, question number two, what are the seven SI base units? List them all. Well, this question is also very easy. Well, the seven SI base units are the following. One, mass, length, time, temperature, amount of substance, electric current, and luminous intensity. Number three, what are the basic components that must be included in a laboratory report? This is also a very simple question. The most important components of a laboratory report are one, title, two, objective, three, materials used, four, procedure, five, data or observations, six, result and discussions, and lastly, seven, conclusion. And coming to the last question, which is the fourth one, mention at least some three laboratory safety rules. Well, you can mention the following as common laboratory safety rules. One, ice must properly be covered with appropriate you know, materials such as eye googles. And each and every student must wear appropriate protective clothing before he or she steps into the laboratory. Three, he or she must not smell any uh, substance that is available in the laboratory. And four, foods and drinks must not be brought into a chemistry laboratory. Well, if you answer the fourth question this way, then you are correct. Dear students, thus far we've been revising and we've seen some of the important points in unit one and I hope you really enjoyed the lesson. And we'll keep in touch next time by other important points from Uni2. And I thank you very much for your patience and time. Goodbye.